Well, hello, everyone. I actually had forgotten until Diane texted the group last week that we're in the prayer group to pray for today's lecture. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> so I just started preparing the, all this stuff. But thank you for the reminder <laughs> to Diane. For those who don't know anything about my background, my name is Selena. Um, I am a registered dietitian in the US and I recently, about four years ago, I moved to Australia. I have not registered here as a registered dietitian because I have been homeschooling my kids. So I have not gone back to work, but I have continued like continuing education in the US. So um, I'm not, have not lost all my information yet. So I was asked by the student club to talk a little bit about superfoods to supercharge your brain. So I was thinking about what kind of foods do we eat that we can actually get to help us to, as students, to be able to mentally improve in our schoolwork. And um, so I thought about seven things um, six of them are food actually that you can eat that consume that actually with recent studies just show that it does improve your brain function in memory, cognition and also long-term benefits for your brain. So because we're such a small group, anytime you have any questions, raise your hands and I'll try to answer them. On the side, so this one? Oh, on, yes. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're gonna look at unlocking the power of food, simple food, basic food that you eat every day to help you to achieve optimal health. So the first one I want to look at is green vegetables specifically. Um, of course, there's hundreds and lots of different kinds of green vegetables that's available out there. And here are just a list of some of them, broccoli, kale, Swiss chard, lettuce, spinach, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, zucchini, and on and on and on. So most of you probably eat this almost every day. And I know um, in our different cultures, there's certain foods that we, certain greens that we like better than others. But today I'm gonna talk about one green vegetable that I think is important and that's readily, readily available in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, most green vegetables, this one is full of vitamin K, lutein. Lutein is a type of antioxidant that's very good for your eyes, for your brain, and that's found in your blood. Basically, it keeps your um, blood clean and helps with um, killing, like we call them antioxidants, that kill out all the bad germs and things that come into our body through the environmental factors like smoking and other things. So lutein is one of the antioxidants found in green vegetables. Folate and beta carotene. Folate is very important, um, helps with balancing hormones, helps with rebuilding our body cells. So one super vegetable that I think that is really important is broccoli. Diane's favorite and um, a lot of studies um, that I've looked at and gone through a lot of the studies actually show that it actually slows down cognitive decline it helps to improve because of the high vitamin K one cup a day of cooked broccoli or raw broccoli does provide you 100% of your vitamin K um, the vitamin K actually is found in your brain cells, helps with the development and the, the nerve tissues of your brain and maintains that. And broccoli, of course, does people with arthritis or other inflammation problems, does help with anti-inflammatory and of course the antioxidant effects. So there are studies that does show that with brain function, it does help. Of course, different ways to eat them for those who have um, lack of ideas. 
You can have them steamed, you can have them raw, you can have them in smoothies, not, maybe not broccoli, but maybe other green vegetables like spinach. It's really good to put in your um, smoothies. Stir fry them, soups, salads, but try to have at least one to two servings of some green vegetable per day. And with the seven um, ideas that I'm going to give you, try to have at least one component of them a day, and then you might be a super brain expert. And you might be able to like pass all your exams 100% without studying. I don't know. <laughs> the second one that I'm um, talking about is berries. Berries specifically like strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, all the different kinds of berries. Um, high, high levels of antioxidants, high in vitamin C. That sourness that you get from the berries actually is the vitamin C that you taste. Um, they protect, again, what are antioxidants? Free radicals. What are free radicals? Environmental um, toxicities that goes into our body, smoke that you inhale, um, that can cause cancer. Anything like metals or things that you eat, they're all free radicals that enter into your body that your body tries to expel. And when you eat these high levels of antioxidants, it boosts your blood's immune or your body's immune system to be able to fight against all these free radicals that enter into your body. People who do not consume a lot of this, you see with their lifestyle, they have more problems with getting infections, with anti um, antibodies that can't fight against diseases, cancers, and things like that. So antioxidants are high levels of um, ways to fight against mainly even cancer. It improves neuron function in your brain, so the nerve tissues, it helps to protect and helps to boost the function of your brain's memory, prevents inflammation, helps you when you get old. So this contributes, a lot of studies now with blueberries are actually contributing highly to preventing dementia. So one, the superfood again, lowers your risk of dementia. The active ingredient, which is a flavonoid, which is also similar to an antioxidant, is an anthocyanide. The color of these berries is what is the strongest vitamin C or antioxidant in the berries, which is really promoted today. So you can see with the antioxidant capacity in these studies, sweet potatoes all the way to kidney beans, you can see the berries have a very high antioxidant level that does prevent a lot of um, dementia and other brain uh, functions and it does improve your cognitive they did studies on people who um, had memory loss and they found that these people actually had an increase of like 28 to 30 percent of cognition after they consumed berries on a consistent basis at least like one cup a day so here there's a clinical trial just to prove that I'm not making things up that um, there was a group of people, 26 adults, between the age of 65 and 77, who were having problems with uh, slight dementia and memory problems. So they took these 26 people and gave them, half of them, uh, blueberry, concentrated blueberry juice for 12 weeks. So they drank one cup a day of this blueberry juice every single day for 12 weeks. And the other one, they gave them like a placebo. They just gave them like, a, they thought it was a blueberry juice, but there was no, it was not. And so the results was that it did improve cognition and there was significant blood flow to the brain and it did improve memory. In different tests that they did, they did use like specific lab tests and brain function scans to prove that there was an improvement, a significant improvement. The placebo, there was none. There was no um, changes. So they did do memory tests. So they would like put up flashcards and other things. So they compared the two groups. And the group that did take the concentrated juice did have a 25, 28 to 30% improvement in brain function. 
So berries are the best, you know, they are a little bit expensive, but you can buy them frozen. They say that the frozen and the fresh, they do not make that much of a difference in terms of the antioxidant level. So in the winter, you can have them frozen, put them in smoothies, put them in, you can have the frozen one and put them in your cereal still. And then of course, during the summer season, you can have them fresh and of course in anything else that you like or just have it by itself. But they do definitely berries, I would promote because they taste good as well. This one I think is a surprise to some of you, turmeric, some of you might not have heard it. Um, it's a very popular spice in the Indian community. They do use it, if when you think of turmeric, you think automatically of the color that's curry. And the Indians do put it into their curries a lot. And the Indians have actually been using this medicinally for hundreds of years for healing and ma mainly for inflammatory. So any body with um, arthritis or any like anti, um, what do you call it? Yeah, let's just talk uh, arthritis, autoimmune diseases within your own body, the way you it attacks itself. They find that turmeric actually helps to decrease the inflammation and the joint pain by consuming this. Of course, um, you don't want to eat it by itself. You don't just take a tablespoon of it by itself. You might choke and die from the, the bitterness and how strong it is. It's a bright yellow. For those who don't know what it is, you can get it readily at any Asian shop. It is a powder. You can find it in curries. It's a color. People use it in coloring. You can add it to rice and it gives it a nice fragrance when you add like a teaspoon of it into your rice and it just turns the rice a little bit yellow. It is not spicy. So it's, um, even though they add it to the curry, they usually add it for the flavor of it. It's a little bit bitter. And once it's mixed with the chili, it actually brings out a very strong aroma. So um, in India, they seem to put it in some mustards and butters and cheeses. So in India, they eat it a lot. Maybe that's why Indians are so smart. I don't know. The ones that we know, maybe. An active compound in the turmeric is um, called curcumin. It's the effect of that compound helps to prevent heart's disease, Alzheimer's, and cancer. Of course, again, it's the anti-inflammatory that we want, that helps also in the brain. We want to keep the brain um, well taken care of, stimulated. We don't want any infections. We don't want any, because um, once your brain is damaged, it's really hard to reverse that. So you want to always make sure that your brain is protected, that our, our brain is actually the only one that has a bone that surrounds the whole of it, from the front to the back. And so we, that is the, most, the, the organ that needs to be most protected. So it does relieve symptoms of depression and arthritis. Some research I've seen, people actually use it for weight loss. Um, some people take it like a tablespoon of it mixed with lemon juice and they drink it in the morning and they say it suppresses your appetite. It makes you not hungry for the rest of the day and pe hundreds of people have actually lost a lot of weight just doing one tablespoon of or one teaspoon of turmeric with lemon juice, just drinking that. I have not tried it. I don't know if it tastes good, but a lot of people have tried it and they have lost a lot of weight doing that. Another clinical trial that they did was in UCLA in America. They took 40 adults aged 50 to 84. All of them had mild memory problems and they split them into two groups, 20-20. One group took like a pill of this turmeric and two times a day and one group took a pill, a placebo pill. And they did this over 18 months, a year and a half. And they used brain scans prior and after the study. And they tested like chemical markers in the brain to check for the Alzheimer's. And most of these people had um, key markers to show that they had possibilities to develop Alzheimer's before the study. And after the study, it showed a 28% improvement in memory tests and improved moods. So there is a significant um, change that you can see. Maybe not a big change, but a 28% is pretty significant in terms of Alzheimer's improvement 
in, the, in these people. So you can use them fresh. They, you can buy them in the roots at, at most markets. I think I've seen them in Woolworths and Coles. It's an orange root. You can cut it up, make it into a tea, um, or you can grate it, slice it, and put it in rice, or blend it with a smoothie where you can't taste it. Or you can use it dried, which you can store it better. You can store usually the turmeric for over a year, and it's still shelf stable. You can put it in powder form, easy to add to food, and you only need about a teaspoon a day. Other ways of consumption that they sell out there, if you buy it at the pharmacy, they do have like turmeric teas with ginger and other things, and it actually is a nice flavor. Um, supplements, they say that if you take a, the pill form, to have it with some black pepper, or they have the black pepper mixed in with the turmeric, and they say the black pepper helps absorption. And um, they have extracts that you can add, like little bottles, and you can add them to water, to juice, and to smoothies. And they say that also helps. Or you, if you have like an infection with inflammation, you can actually get the extract and actually put it on the wound directly. And it actually helps to reduce the inflammation as well. So lots of different other ways that you can use turmeric. The fourth one that I think is also important is nuts and seeds. I like this one because it's the component of nuts and seeds also not just brings just the chemical component, but also gives you, as vegetarians or vegans, a nice like protein component as well to it. So, there's so many different kinds of nuts and seeds that you would never run out of ideas of eating it and you would you know, mix it, in, put it in a trail mix, have it available at any meal. You can put it in salads, you can put them in basically anything or just have them raw on the go. These nuts and seeds, they're healthy fats. The main components of these is the proteins and the fats that come with it, the monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, you can blend them and use them instead as peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter. There's all different kinds of butters that most people have not tried. Most people just eat it, eat peanut butter. And, um, but the fat content that comes with this, for those who don't know what mono and polyunsaturated, it's a, a fat that's liquid at room temperature. You, don't, you want to consume as many fats that's liquid at room temperature versus lard, butter, because when you have them at room temperature, they're solid. And so when you eat something that's solid, that goes into your body, the solid part is a saturated fat. It, all, it stays a fat. It stays solid. So when you eat it, it stays solid. It just starts building and lines the blood vessels of fat. That's what you call people who have strokes or thinning of the blood vessels where fats deposit on your blood vessels and that's from consuming saturated fat. So saturated fat is a hard fat that does not melt and when you consume it, it stays hard in your body and absorbs hard as you're into your blood vessels and they cannot break that down. So it, they just deposit it into your blood vessels and that's where you get thinning of the blood vessels, atherosclerosis. So you wanna have these healthy fats because they're liquid at room temperature and these liquid at room temperature actually are the carriers so it's like a little car it's like a little shopping cart when you eat it it goes into your blood vessels and takes that hard fat from your blood vessels and actually excretes it out so consuming these actually can decrease your chances of um, strokes and heart attacks for especially those in the like cardiac units or those who do have problems with this or who've had a lifetime of eating bad fats, this is a good um, remedy for decreasing that in your blood vessels a natural way rather than going in for surgery and trying to put in stents and all of that. Of course, it comes with the highest B group vitamins. So it has most of the B group vitamins in there, which of course comes with the proteins. Most proteins have the B group vitamins. And so it is um, B group vitamins help to rebuild your cells in your body and it helps to build DNA. So you do need those B group vitamins. And of course it comes with many essential minerals that most other vegetables do not have. 
So you can have your calcium, zinc, magnesium, selenium, manganese, copper. That's important because your brain uses these to, you know, when the elect when they do firing of the neutrons, neurons, neutrons, neurons, the firing, the synapses and all that, they require these essential minerals to do that. And so when you don't have that, or those who are lacking in these minerals seem to have a slower response, seem to have um, more memory loss. And they're finding that this with dementia patients as well, having to make sure that they do supplement continuously with these micronutrients or the essential minerals. One super nut that I recommend that you eat regularly on a cons regular basis is walnuts. Um, significantly high concentrations of DAH, DHA, which is an omega-3 fatty acid, um, similar to what you can find in what they promote eating fish. So you can get this in walnuts and it seems to, studies seem to show that actually walnuts do have a higher amount and more absorbable amount. Um, improved cognition function in adults, it's shown that it prevents decline or degeneration of your brain cells, and it does, in general, lower your blood pressure. Another super seed that you can mix with your walnuts is pumpkin seeds. Same again, omega-3 fatty acids, contributing to health, healthy brain development, aids in your memory, all similar to most what nuts and seeds, but the highest of these are the walnuts and the pumpkins that seems to have the highest amount of vitamins and micronutrients and um, seems to have lesser fat. So if you have things like um, the cashews, it's a little more creamy, has a little more fat. So if you are uh, watching your weight or watching you know, your calories, um, these are more of the seeds that you want to take because it's lower in the higher fats, but still gives you your omega-3 fatty acids for the day. So another study, they took 10,000 individuals. This is a national health study that they did. They gave these 10,000 individuals that they had to eat a handful of walnuts, two, more than two servings a week, two to, maybe two to four servings a week. And after maybe like two years, they did a study on them and they found significant cognition function. It, it was aside from race, gender, they took all of that out and they just based it on the amount of walnuts. And they said even those who consumed alcohol, those who consumed, who didn't exercise or who smoked, they still found that taking the walnuts two to three times a week did still improve their cognitive function regardless of them still doing all these other activities. So imagine if you didn't do all those and you still ate the walnuts, how much more improvement that you would have had over time. The fifth superfood that I really like that's also available in Australia is avocados. Um, avocados in the past, people try to avoid because they say it's high in fat, don't take too much of it. Um, but recently, the, more studies have shown that it's a good replacer actually for um, people who like to consume a lot of like lard or butter and like um, to do a lot of those frying and stuff. So they're saying this is a good um, substitute. So instead of putting butter on your toast in the mornings or sandwiches, use the avocado instead because it has more nutrition, more nutritive value. Um, it does protect against nerve cells in the brain and of course again your memory concentration cognition it decreases your ldl so it's the same as the nuts it has the mono and polyunsaturated it's the ones that increase your hdl which is the good cholesterol and it takes away all your bad cholesterol the ldl um, and it reduces the risk of strokes and a lot of in the cardiac um, settings a lot of people are trying to promote more now a ve vegetarian, vegan-based diet. I know in Stanford, in um, America now, they're actually promoting vegan diets for the cardiac patients. And it seems to have a significant change in um, the changes of that. Um, high levels, again, of lutein, which is a carotenoid, which is only found in your eyes, in your brain, and in your blood. 
and that is an antioxidant that anything that goes into your brain, if there's high levels of lutein, it can fight against these free radicals and actually get rid of them, reducing the amounts of probably tumors and cancers that can develop long term. Um, for their um, fats, they do contain a wide variety of nutrients and also s small amounts of micronutrients. Surprisingly, those, I was surprised that it actually contains 25% soluble and 75% insoluble fiber. Um, for those of you who don't know the difference between fiber, there's two types of fiber. The insoluble fiber, so you imagine is like a tree. It doesn't digest, it doesn't break down in your stomach, it actually forms the bulk of your stool. So for people who eat a lot of insoluble fiber tend to be able to have no problems with constipation. They go to the toilet pretty easily. And that's the insoluble, it's like the tree branches that doesn't digest, once you eat it, it just cleans your intestines like a brush. The insoluble fiber is the, it's like a jelly-like fiber, like the leaves of the tree that, um, sticks to the soluble, insoluble fiber and actually cleans together with the insoluble fiber. And that's what forms the fiber in your gut or in your intestines to keep your intestines and colon clean. So I, apparently this is a very good amount of insoluble fiber that most people have a hard time getting today because of all the processed food that we get. So the more processed the food, the more your tree is cut down into smaller branches and does not clean as well. So you want to have insoluble fiber that is not broken down, that's natural, that you eat on its own, that has that, those branches that can clean your intestines and give you regular bowel movements as well. So this is another study um, where they, this is a pretty intense where they ate one avocado a day and they found that it increased their lutein levels by 25%. And through the tests, they sh it showed that people actually had better, they were able to pay attention for longer periods of time. And they, they had better memory. And it seemed like the, when they took certain tests, their speed of recognition and cognition was a bit faster after the consumption of avocado once a day. I don't know about taking once a day, it's a little too intense, but you know, trying to eat it regularly or a quarter of it a day of, a, of an avocado a day or two to three a week, I think is still a good way to get your, your monounsaturated, polyunsaturated and your vitamins and your lutein levels to help with brain function as well. Any question? No? So, I'm sure we all know how to eat avocado, so I won't go into that. The sixth one, and the, the second to last one is water. Um, we all know what water is, it's free, we can get it, and I encourage, and Australia actually has really good water, like in America, there's no way that you would get, you would drink tap water. Um, everyone in America buys their water from Costco in big barrels and jars. We've never drank tap water till we came to Australia. Um, so we're actually very lucky to have good clean water that we can consume. And so there should be no excuse that we shouldn't drink it. But most people drink on average only 3.3 cups a day. The recommended average would be about eight to 10 cups. And so most people actually now drink more alcohol and soda or flavored drinks than they do of water. And that comes with a lot of sugar, that comes with more problems with like diabetes and other things on the rise because of all the sugary drinks that we take. The first thing that we teach our patients who are trying to lose weight is to cut, down your, cut out your sugary drinks and alcohol. And those people who actually switch from just drinking sugary drinks and alcohol and switching to just drinking water lose up to one to two kilos a week just from that change. So um, most people are dehydrated um, because we don't drink enough water. And dehydration, actually, when you feel dehydrated, you can have a sense of feeling that you're hungry and you try to eat to compensate for that. But a lot of times, if you drink water, 
In between your meals, you tend to not feel hungry until your next meal. And a lot of times if we're dehydrated, your body craves for something and you think that it's food that you need and it's actually just water. So your body is, a lot of it is water. So we do need water to keep hydrated and to keep alert, to keep awake and to keep functioning during the day. So during your studies, during your exam time, drink lots of water to keep your body clean, hydrated and to keep awake instead of caffeine. So I recommend, or most we would recommend, eight to ten cups a day. Try to drink, bring a water bottle with you, or if you don't have one, which we most of us do, but at least try to drink every two hours when you're awake during the day, or more if you can. So water helps to clean your body, keep it clean, clears your skin, eliminates bad breath, decreases fatigue, keeps you alert, prevents dehydration, and Surprisingly, it decreases your mood swings. So if you feel moody or grumpy or hangry or whatever, drink water and that can actually help to lower your mood swings and maintain your weight. So when you feel hungry, drink lots of water, then you won't tempt you to eat. Last one, exercise and rest. I know this is not a food item, but I felt like it's very important in the mix of brain health as well and keeping our body healthy. Exercise, long-term benefits, of course, decreases your blood pressure. When you exercise, you have the ability to stay relaxed, stay calm, and to be able to focus more. Um, it decreases your body fat, maintain weight and body composition, strengthens your bones, and um, you have less back pain when you're sitting down and when you're in class you have more ability to stay focused. Again, it relaxes and revitalizes. It reduces your mental stress. When you feel very stressed, actually going for a run or exercising actually can reduce your muscular tension and your um, mental stress right away. It's almost immediate. And helps to maintain your focus during whatever you need in your work or in your schoolwork promotes better sleep. So those of you who are having a little bit of insomnia or having trouble sleeping at night, um, this actually helps to promote sleep physically because you're expending all your energy and then reduces your stress, increasing your metabolism. So when you exercise, you can eat more. So it's a win-win situation. So you can, if you like to eat more, then exercise more and then you will be able to maintain your body weight better. Increasing your blood flow to your brain, bringing oxygen to your brain, helping you to think clearer and to be able to focus on your work uh, longer. So if you want to calculate what is your exercise heart rate, this is the calculation. You get 220 minus your age times by 60%. That should be your heart rate that you should achieve when you exercise. And you should maintain it at that rate at least for 15 to 20 minutes at that heart rate if you want to have optimal exercise and to lose weight. If you don't reach that, usually your, your, your blood flow is not high enough to be able to, to start um, with weight loss and to, to have a vigorous exercise. So try to stick with the FIT fit frequency, try to exercise daily. How intense, try to reach your estimated, your heart rate at least every day and try to do at least 30 minutes of exercise. Just be it brisk walking, a slight jog or going to the gym or going for a swim. Housework, continuous like housework, uh, strenuous housework could also do the same as well. So your activity pyramid. Um, you can see, same as the food pyramid, try to walk every day, park your car further away. I did not know I had to walk like 300 kilometers to get here in my shoes. And I was like, why did you park so far? But I got my exercise. <laughs> um, you can walk the dog, do your uh, yard work, try to focus on doing more activities um, that require exercise that you don't think that is exercise, but could contribute to that while well, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, 
and other things like that. Of course, limit watching TV, sitting down, but when we're at school, how do you limit that? But try to, in between that, try to get in your exercise to get your blood flow going between classes so that you can stay awake to do your schoolwork. Rest. All of us have lack of sleep. All of you look like you could just fall on the ground right now and pass out and go to sleep. <laughs> so lack of sleep is expected in everybody's lives because we're so busy. But try to get at least seven to eight hours of sleep every night. When uh, some studies have shown that when you have lack of sleep, you get inaccurate perceptions, you get really sensitive, and then you start like, what are you trying to say? Or, you know, when people talk to you, you feel a little more um, irritated. Um, you get delayed decision making, decrease, decreased clarity, you have more mood swings, so eat more walnuts. And uh, slows memory, difficulty focusing, intolerance to noise, slower reflexes. So just having that lack of sleep can contribute you to having a worse off day. So recommended is eight hours of sleep. Best, they say that your REM is best if you sleep before midnight. So even an hour before midnight, you tend to have better sleep than if you sleep after midnight. It's, it's interesting because I'm like, how does your body know when it's midnight? But yeah. So if we slept one hour less each weeknight and 30 minutes less each weekend, you would actually be de deprived of 338 hours of sleep a year, which is two full weeks of not sleeping at all. So try to get as much sleep as you can, Diane. <laughs> it's over. Some of you, I'm sure, probably have a month worth of no sleep. So the less you sleep, your body it accumulates over the year and it does have an effect on your body as well in long term. So they, they did this experiment where they got a lab rat and they didn't allow him to sleep for two weeks. They woke him up consistently and they had noise and light shining and stimulating him for two weeks straight. It, after two weeks, he died of an infection. Um, they, he developed skin lesions. His immune function was almost nothing. and. Um, he died after two weeks of no sleep. So it can kill you, so get your sleep. In a tent or wherever you are, get your sleep. <laughs> Human studies have shown that less than eight hours of sleep reduces significantly your white blood cell count to fight infection, to fight disease, and you do have a depressed immune response from lack of sleep. So those during exam periods, times, try to get as much sleep because you tend to get sick easier when you have less sleep and you're a little more stressed out. So focus on getting more sleep so you can stay healthy during that time and actually be able to do better in your schoolwork. So for optimal brain function, try to sleep at least eight hours a night. Sleep before midnight and if you have a hard time sleeping, try to relax, do something 30 minutes before you sleep, read a book or listen to some music before you go to sleep instead of just finishing your studies and then trying to get into bed and sleep. And then you've got all these things that you've memorized floating around in your head and you can't sleep. So in Philippians 4 verse 8, I close with this verse. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. So focus on the positive, focus on what is available for you that um, can help you. Um, we don't need all these artificial things to help stimulate us or keep us awake. The God has created all these things to give us a healthy body and to help us to be able to do our optimum at our best. Do you guys have any other questions? Yeah. Is it better to eat nuts roasted or raw? Raw. They say raw, but um, if you roast it, it changes the fat composition as well. So if you roast it, lightly roast it is okay, but don't roast it until it's like charred or really dark, because when you do that, you're changing the fat composition. 
of that and it's not the monopolyunsaturated fat that you get. So it's just like frying, like if you get oil, like a olive oil and you use heat it up to a high temperature, you can turn that from a polyunsaturated fat to a saturated fat. Any other questions? But we were told that she can't have, she had a high cholesterol, she has a high cholesterol, and we were told that she can't have um, avocado. Do you know why the doctor would say that, if it's supposed to help lower? The because they think it's a fat. So most, most um, people think it's a high fat, so they say, oh, that you shouldn't have it. But in actual fact, avocados do not contribute to high cholesterol because avocado does not contain cholesterol. Okay. So, it has, so she can still eat it? She can still eat. What I would cut down is the animal fats and the yeah. dairy. So cut down on the eggs, the milk, the cheese, and any animal fat or animal or any meat, try to cut that down rather than the natural vegetables and fruits and nuts that they get because all of that does not contain cholesterol. Because I thought a similar thing, but then when we sat in front of the doctor, she told us she couldn't have it. No. I was just speaking things. And I just have another question. No. Um, That's when okay. When you talked about saturated, I thought there was a type of polyunsaturated fat that wasn't good for you. Or is that, is, is there another way of, is that just to be so there's I saturated fats and then there's unsaturated fats, is that right? So saturated fats, basically if you look at the chemical bond, yeah. it's basically the fat has hydrogen bonds all around it. Okay. Um, polyunsaturated is where there's double bonds all through it, which, is, which makes it liquid at room temperature. And monounsaturated fat is the same, where it has a double, one double bond in the, in the chemical composition, which makes it also liquid at room temperature. Saturated fat is basically where I can, I think you're talking about high, um, the, the high fructose, it's not corn syrup, but there's a fat, oh, to look back in my notes, but there's a fat that they use in the, in the cooking industry that they get a vegetable fat, which is a polyunsaturated, and then they heat it to high temperatures so that it becomes a solid at room temperature, which is margarines. So actually margarines are not really that good for you because it's a solid at room temperature. So if you, all margarines are taken and they are heated to high temperatures to add the hydrogen carbons to take away those double bonds and to make it solid at room temperature. And that's basically you're turning it from a polyunsaturated fat into a saturated fat. So I guess in terms of that, you are correct that those polyunsaturated fats actually do not, um, are not that really that good for you because it's a solid at room temperature. So the gauge that I would use is the more solid it is at room temperature, if you put it on the table and at room temperature around 28, 26 degrees, it's solid, I would not consume that because then the, the food industry has just saturated it with hydro hydrogens to make it into a solid. So things like coconut oil are okay? That's a controversial issue because there's the, the wellness industry, like, the, like you go to the health food stores, they promote it like crazy. Whereas the medical side and the clinical side, so many studies have shown like it's a saturated fat. And so it's kind of controversial because the medical, the medical field, they're like, limit it, be careful, take it in small amounts. Whereas this wellness, I don't know, they promote it like crazy, but there's no significant studies to show that taking lots of coconut oil has any health benefits. Because like, if you look in Asia, like Malaysia, Thailand, they use a lot of coconut oil in their cooking, in their curries and stuff. And you find that a lot of the population there has high cholesterol and high, high um, heart problems and strokes and heart attacks because of the high consumption of coconut oil. So I have read, seen studies that show significant, um, 
shows significant um, causes not to take it because it does have um, Im implications that it is not that healthy for you. But of course, any fat, you want to be careful how much you eat. Because I know some people who are at the stream where they take a tablespoon of coconut oil a day by mouth. And they say, oh, because they say it's good for you. But it is, coconut oil is actually a, satur a naturally saturated fat, which is solid at room temperature. So I would be careful with that as well. With any oils, especially if anyone has high cholesterol, to limit the amount of oils. And even with the oils that you have, try not to heat it to high temperatures. So like olive oil, if you heat it to high temperatures, it actually changes the composition of it with the heat and actually makes it rancid. Rancid means the oil goes off and it smells different when you start cooking with it. It has a different smell and a taste afterwards that you, when you cook it. So if you look at how the Mediterranean people use oil, they actually just, they don't cook the olive oil, they just put it on the salads. And that has a more beneficial effect on your body than it does when you cook with it. So people here are buying the olive oil and using it to cook. And that's um, the opposite to what is recommended. It's actually supposed to be used in its natural form. That's why we pay so much for it. Because the olives, they have to press, cold press the olive to extract that oil in its raw form. So that, that raw form is what we consume to give us the health benefits. But we're buying it for $20 a bottle and then we're cooking it and changing the composition and it's not giving us that health benefit anymore. Are there any oils that you can raise to higher temperatures and keep They say coconut oil is actually really shelf stable because it's a saturated fat. So they're saying you is using that doesn't change the composition of the oil, but that's already a saturated fat. So most oils, when you heat it to high temperatures for frying, except lard, actually does change a little bit in its composition. So try not to deep fry or you know, cook like pan fry with oil too much because it does change that composition a little bit. Yeah, try to like bake instead of fry and stuff like that, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.